Welcome to another episode of Don't Shit on the Bus. I am your host, Adam Elmakais, coming at you all the way from lovely Los Angeles, California. And this week, we are joined by none other than Moose. That is his nickname. It is name his friends call him, so it's a name we will refer to him as, and he is a tour bus driver. And you know this, that is kind of the theme of this podcast, right? Don't shit on the bus. So to talk to the source of the don't shit on the bus rule, what an honor. I can't believe we didn't have this episode on earlier, but it is one of our classic episodes of what does a tour bus driver do on tour? So during this episode, we're going to cover, you know, what he does on a daily basis, what his path into the industry was, and how when you go on tour, you can kind of, you know, not treat the tour bus driver unintentionally, poorly, unintentionally. You know, you can do everything the right way because you know it, not the wrong way because you didn't know it. And that's a good resource to have because a tour bus driver, man, they have everybody's lives in their hands. So it's an important job on the road and you don't often get to bond with your driver because they drive while you sleep. And so I was happy to have uh, Moose on the podcast because that is, you know, we started off with mostly on the road and now we're getting some people that are talking to us about what goes on behind the scenes off the road or the tour bus drive. We're just touching everything and I like how the podcast is kind of morphing over time. You know, we've got to we got to find more things to talk about, more things to learn about so that we can better prepare everybody for being on the road. Or if you're already on the road, you know, you can improve your current on the road game. But before we get to the podcast, I have to Always thank our new patrons, Libby and Graham. Thank you so much for joining us this week and hopefully stick with us for a while. I will get your care packages out momentarily. As always, anybody who signs up gets a care package. And I just want to say thank you to all the people that have been around here. Some of you guys are coming up on a year because we're almost on 52 episodes, 54 episodes. 54 episodes makes a year. This is episode 50. So thank you guys for supporting. You know, you pay on a per episode basis. So if we put an episode out, you help support it. And, you know, that pays Connor. That helps me out. It's amazing. I know. I, I hope the podcast is enough in return. I feel forever indebted to you. Uh, hopefully I can meet up with you when you're in LA. I know I missed somebody this week, but I did hang out with somebody last week. If you're ever in LA, hit me up. Maybe it's your first time here. You're confused. It doesn't count if you're in Orange County. You got to come to LA. Hit me up. I will do my best to make time. I'm busy, but not too busy for the supporters of the podcast. So with that being said, enjoy this episode of Don't Shit on the Bus. I will see you next week. All right. So, I mean, Jeremy or Moose? More Moose. I, I've right. been Moose since I was 12. Nice. Moose it is. I like to call people what their friends call them. You know, like I don't want to yeah. call somebody what they sign their emails with. I want to, I want to, you know, I want to talk oh, to them. No. About the oh, no. oh no, my email still says Moose too. So oh, you're, uh, you're through and through Moose. Well, I, I mean, we talked briefly, but unlike a lot of my guests here, we actually, I actually don't know your history very much, but you mentioned that you came to touring through a much more I guess, organic path than I envision most drivers. You started in a band. Is that correct? My first actual tour, I was, I was, you know, friends with a bunch of people. And one day my friend Aaron called me and he's a singer for Death Threat. And he was like, Hey, what are you doing in August? And I was like, I mean, I was a roofer. So, I mean, I, I was toiling away, breaking myself down. And I was like, I don't know why. Roofing. <laughs> yeah, I'm roofing. He's like, do you want to go on tour? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> So, and that was the start of it. You know, I, I climbed into a van. It was six of us in an Astro van with a U-Haul trailer, which by no means six people should not ride in a U-Haul, in a, an Astro van. It was something like 28 shows in 30 days. Oh man, I just Googled an Astro van because I didn't know what it was. And <laughs> even more respect, it's not like no. a 15 passenger van. It's like a, it's like a soccer it's like mom a family. van. It's a family van. Yeah. We left Connecticut. We left New Britain. And the first show was in Mesa, Arizona. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it was a little bit of a hike to get to the first show. But you know what? We I wouldn't trade that first tour. The second tour I did, any tour I ever did, good or bad, I wouldn't trade any of them. Yeah, there's a lot of firsts on a tour like that, right? There's a lot, especially for somebody who's uh, coming from uh, roofing. I'm, I mean, I'll make an assumption here that it doesn't take you all over the U.S. And to, to have a job no. that takes you all over the U.S., like what a great thing to have. No, no. I mean, I got all over New England with roofing, but, you know, yeah. I just saw the same the same sights for months at a time and granted i i still carried over from that to this i mean i was on a roof many mornings when the sun still wasn't up you know okay. i got to see the sun come up over like 
you know, cityscapes or, you know, whatever. And it was, that was the best time of the day for me. It still is. As you even say that, I get so excited because I have so many questions I'm excited to ask you about your job. But yeah. for the sake of going chronologically, I want to know more about you first. So you go on your first tour with a band. And then how long did you tour? I mean, were you as crew? Were you a crew member at that point? Or what were you doing? I basically just went along for the ride. You know, I would do some driving shifts and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, it was the, the first few tours were very DIY, you know. I mean, one cell phone between six people. MapQuest? Uh, no, not even MapQuest. We just took we just got a Rand McNally map from Walmart, six dollars, and we would get to the city and just call the promoter and find out where we had to go. <laughs> so I mean, it was it was the good old days. Yeah, is this like the early two thousands or when when is this? This is this, this is two thousand. Yeah, my first tour was in two thousand seven, so we're a little more spoiled than you. So this is this is wild <laughs> to hear about before MapQuest. It's like. Yeah, yeah. If it wasn't for that one, for for Steve having a good job and having a cell phone, we would have had none. So, and he was, I mean, no, that was the second tour. First tour, we didn't have a cell phone. Oh, man. Yeah, scratch that. First tour, we did not have a cell phone, which made it even more fun. You're really in the middle. You're really just out there and living, right? You're just in the moment. I, yeah. I, I, th those were good yeah. times, I imagine. Yeah, you know, cameras, people, and just getting into as much trouble as possible. I know, right? Okay, so you're in a van, you're touring, you're kind of just doing the whole, like, I just want to go on tour, I'll figure out what works for me, I'll drive, I'll do whatever, I'll load in. Yeah. And then from there, like, I know you eventually now end up being a bus driver, but what are all the steps in between? Like, what what's next? So from there, I mean, before I did, before I did that first tour, I had a band that did, like, 10 shows that did nothing. Uh, and then a friend of mine, he was singing for a band and kind of had the outs with them, and... You know, they they tried out somebody and had them play. It was terrible, you know, and then they were, you know, decided to look for somebody else. And I just I talked my way into it and I got to do some shows here in the States and Canada. But I got to go to Europe and, you know, play shows. So uh, one of the greatest times of my life, 2001 touring Europe in a, in a sprinter. You know, most of us were larger sized gentlemen, so really wasn't comfortable. And this is before sprinters could recline. Oh, wow. So you're sitting up. Yeah. But did that and then. You know, I went and toured again, just hanging out and stuff like that. Continued. I went back to roofing in between. You know, I do some stuff here and there. Fast forward to 2010, I started tour managing, which, you know, it can be good or bad. You definitely learn everything when you tour manage, like all parts of the tour, everything that's going on. Yeah, yeah. And babysitting. And I liked it. It got me, it got me back to Europe. I got to walk a promoter to well the promoter of the entire tour to the atm to pay us what he was skimming off the top oh gotcha you figured out somebody was messing with you guys i feel like when you're a tour manager look i haven't seen how tall you are but i can see that you're you know you've got some muscle to you i feel like when you're a tour manager and somebody's skimming money off you it helps to have the build you do where you're like oh you're gonna pay us now yeah 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 so that was i mean that was as, as shady as that was i guess you know it was fun <laughs> <laughs> because there was money just owed to us that, you know, he, he basically was taking two thirds of the tour money. Oh, wow. Cause, cause he booked the tour, which is insane. Yeah. But no, I did that. And then before that happened, I had my L5 ruptured. What's an L5? Back. Oh, back. It, back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Disc in the lower back. It ruptured. It went really bad. I healed up. I went back to roofing in between, but two years later it went again and it was just the end of it. Like I couldn't go back to roofing. So I tried my hand at managing and booking. I did. Okay. Booking is difficult. If you have, especially if you have a band that, you know, people want, but they want more, you know, they get those other bands that they want more. Managing was good. I think the only thing that I haven't done in this industry aside, you know, aside from like the, the technical parts of like, you know, sound lights, so on and so forth is merch. Yeah. And I had no interest in doing merch. Just, I mean, I, I like people from a distance and I have enough friends that have done merch where I just see, you know, the end of the night frustration of, you know, 500 kids going, can I get the black one? Yeah. <laughs> that can I, one. Can I try, can I try that on? <laughs> can, can you hold, can you hold this to me for me to the end of the night? I promise I'll be back for it. Yeah. I, I, I would just didn't have the patience for it. And so I just never did it. So fast forward to late 2012, my fiance at the time, uh, her and her partner were managing the case restraint. Okay. And they had two van flips in five days. And for those who can't infer what that <laughs> means, it means their van flipped on while they were driving. Yeah. Somebody messed up. Yeah. That's uh, the first, the first, it was just the TM, the merch guy and the sound guy. Everybody else had flown out to the West coast. They had, an, they had an accident. That van was totaled. We found them another van, another trailer. 
They picked up the guys at the first show. They were on their way to Arizona. And whoever's driving hit the brakes alongside a tractor trailer truck. And it just started doing this. And then said, so next thing they know, they were looking out the windshield at the semi side of it. And it, just, and it just started rolling. Oh, my God. So after that, they kind of canceled. The, they, they canceled the tour. Yeah. So two of them, two, three of them were in two van accidents within five days. The sound guy actually was in three that year. That would make me quit touring. He, he, he did for a while. He, he absolutely did for a while. But so they had a tour coming up and they were talking about it, how they're going to do it. You know, and they were still, you know, obviously very apprehensive about getting back in a van. So they were looking at bandwagons and, you know, they needed a driver, you know, and she had asked me if I, you know, thought about driving. I said, you know, I, I, I love touring. I, I love being on the road and, you know, I, I can give it a shot. And, you know, she's like, have you driven something that big before? And you go big or you go home. I said, oh, absolutely. <laughs> that was my first hired drive. I got paid okay. But when we got to Indiana to pick up the bandwagon, I got out of the van and I walked up to the bandwagon and I just said, what did I get myself into? Because of how big it was? Yeah, because of how big it was. And the first show was at the bottom lounge in Chicago. Oh, wow. That's a long drive. I think this would be a really good point just to sidestep and explain what a bandwagon is because they're relatively new in the U.S., and they don't exist yeah. other places. So no. maybe we could just talk about like what makes them different than a van and different than a bus and why you, somebody who hasn't driven one before, was able to drive it. It's kind of cool. It's basically a nice in-between between like the van and the Sprinter and a bus. So it basically this company took the biggest box frame truck that they could. They started with like internationals and freight liners. I think now they just uh, they all run. Is it Peterbilt's? One of them, mm -hmm. but you know, they, they came up with a concept and they built a box in the back. That's basically an RV. You can have eight bunks. You can have nine bunks. It has couches, uh, a shower, a toilet sink, you know, a place to sit, TV, fridge, microwave, your whole, all your amenities, like, you know, a little home on wheels. They basically bandwagon that is, they just want to make sure that you're over 25 and you have insurance and that's it. I not, not knocking them, but they kind of hope that they can, you know, keep your security deposit for digging it up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we need this extra money. So, I mean, it's, it's a good concept. It, you know, it, it definitely helps a lot of bands that were in a bus that can't afford a bus because I mean, the driver pay isn't set. That's negotiated between you and who you hire. You don't have to buy hotel rooms. I, like I said, I'm I'm six one, and when I started, I was like just under three hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. And you sleep in the and you sleep in the cab. So you sleep in the you sleep in the front area where you drive. There's also a place for you to sleep up there. Okay, there's a, there's a bunk right behind the seats. So my problem at the end was I realized that I was spending sixteen hours a day in that cab, I'm not being claustrophobic. I got really claustrophobic. But for what it is, it's a perfect a perfect medium in between. In, in doing tours, I would get emails for other tours. And some of them I really regretted turning down, but they overlapped with stuff I already had booked. Like I got an offer. I got three offered three times for Helmet. And growing up, they were, you know, one of my favorite bands. And it was just like the 17 year old of me was ecstatic. But then it's like yeah. a tour overlapped with it with, you know, Silverstein. So it was just like I had to turn stuff down. I know that was a really simple choice for you, but I think that is a really big point to make especially with, you know, our community is like the right way to tour is you usually always stick to your word. You don't bail on people unless you can cover no. it. Unless you can replace yourself and make it yes. everything perfect. You always stick yes. to your word, even if it may, means missing, I think, a bigger opportunity sometimes. Oh, ab absolutely. You know, and like I said, the, I, three times I got the offer and I already had stuff booked for it. And it was just a case of like, you know, I would love to say, yeah, I would always be in the back, you know, polite and you know, I would love to say, yes, I know you've offered me before, but I just, you know, I already have things booked. Let me see who I can try and find for you. Within the bandwagon, I guess, community uh, amongst us drivers, you know, there's there's quite a few of us that banded together. And, you know, if an offer would come through, we would try and help find a fill for that. Keep each other hired. We still like some of us still get offers that come through. Uh, if I know somebody that's looking for a driver, I said, this is who you want or that's who you want or and depending on timeline and all that. Just, to, just to, you know, because it always comes down the line is like, even if it's friends of friends of friends, you still want to make sure that they're safe. And because, I mean, it, it's dangerous. I mean, you got a lot of people's lives in your hands. And mm -hmm. if you've never ridden on a bandwagon, which I'm assuming a lot of people haven't, they're not the easiest ride. They're pretty bumpy and they're not the safe. If you get in an accident, one of those things, you're pretty much it's not safe. Yeah, it, it really, it, honestly, it really does come down to the driver. I would tell people, you know, when I would get offers, I would, you know, I'd go back to the management or whoever I said, you know, you're not going to find a driver at that pay scale. Yeah. You know, I had a, I had a band hit me up for Warp Tour one year and they were offering 500 a week for Warp Tour. 
Oh goodness. Which is like what? $70 a day. Yeah. And I, I, I emailed back very respectfully and I said, you know, I don't, I don't mean to sound rude or anything. I'm like, but do you mind if I ask how much your band is getting paid per day? And they came back and they said, you know, they're getting 500 a day. And I said, with all due respect, I said, getting $500 a day, you can't afford this. Yeah. I get it. I'm like, but you're relying too heavily on merch sales that you don't know if it's going to be hit or miss. I said, you, the, the 500 a day barely covers the bandwagon in the trailer. You still, have to, you still have to pay for fuel. You still have to pay your driver. You still have to pay your crew. I said, you know, find a friend of the band and take their van and trailer and let somebody drive and experience it for, you know, 400 a week, you know, and just get to see the country and, you know, maybe get their foot in the door doing it. You know, I have a friend, he did his first tour was Warp Tour and he did it for free just to get the experience. Oh yeah. I think we, I, I mean, I think we grew up in a similar way and I can definitely relate to, you know, trying to get barcodes on Warp Tour so I could eat catering. You know what I mean? It's just like, yes. <laughs> just like, yo, can I use your barcode today? <laughs> Are you not eating? Yeah. Can I buy your barcode? Oh my what's God. Your num- what's your, what's your number? I haven't been homeless, but I have almost been homeless on Warp Tour. Definitely close to. Yeah. Yeah. If it came back, I would be first in line to drive for Warp Tour again. I loved Warp Tour. Dude, it's fun. Yeah. It, 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 I miss it. I'm sure you do too. It's, you know, I had summer camp with a music festival and Groundhog's Day. Anyhow. Yeah. So that's, I, that's how I got started. And, you know, and it just became a case of they put me on the mailing list at Bandwagon and, you know, word of mouth. People would, you know, refer me and it just snowballed from there. Yeah. You do a good job. Good recommendation. Yep. And we touch on that a lot in the podcast. You know, it's all about who you know, who knows you. That's really how it works. And it's cool to hear that even it works that way, you know, on a driver level. But I wanted to quick ask you a question. It's kind of crazy to me that an artist would try to, whether it's intentional or not, cheap out on paying the person that drives them. Like to me, that seems like it would be one of the most expensive and worth it costs of a tour. Yeah. And I, and, and I wouldn't say, obviously I can't say for everybody, Yeah, but I'm going to say for the fact that it's more management than anything. Okay. Because they're trying to like with any good manager, you're trying to make your artists as much money as you can and cut every corner that you can so that, you know, they go home with the most money that they possibly can. And it's not so much a safety factor. It's just, they're looking at numbers. Some of them, there are some out there that know what drivers should be getting paid and they just don't want to pay it. Yeah. Because again, they're trying to get, they're trying to keep their bottom line high. Yeah. No, that's fair. I've definitely laid down and gone to sleep in a bunk before and heard rumble strips and been like, <laughs> tonight might be the night, guys. And, you yeah. know, it's a scary part of tour. And I just hope that management is spending good money on it when I go on the road. You know, and, you know, I like I said, I enjoyed my time doing it. I, I did. I worked with some great bands. I worked with good people. And, you know, thankfully, I only had a few bad apples, I guess. Are you saying bad apples as in people you worked with or situations that you came across? Just bands, like band members and stuff like that. You know, and it's either you catch somebody on the way up or the way down. On the way up, they think they're bigger than they are. On the way down, they're bitter because they're slipping. And I've definitely realized that, too. You know, it, it's such an interesting, I don't know what to call it, uh, like, path that you have to go through as an artist. And I'm sure as a Mm -hmm. driver, you get to witness that so firsthand. Where do you feel like artists in their career reach a point where they're just the best? Because you hear those stories and where like, like on the way up and way down, you said it's probably not ideal. So where is like the ideal place for them be and how do they get there? I think the most ideal place, because we, I mean, we all know that not everybody makes it to that top tier. And I I think for an artist to sustain, sustain a living out of it even if it's not you know over the top is perfect yeah like support their family pay their mortgage have a balanced life it's probably ideal yeah and you know sometimes people fly under the radar that you don't realize are still there i had the opportunity in early in my in my bus career i i drove for an artist that i didn't even realize was still making records yes and it was it was i they told me who i'm like they're still playing you know, and you think like, oh, it's just like small places and, you know, it's just scattered crowds and they're just trying to hold on. But and realistically, mm-hmm. like I went and I listened to the last record that they put out and it was phenomenal. <laughs> it was such a great record. That's it, great. It, yeah. And I watched the show one night, you know, we had a day off and I, had, I could actually go. It was so good. They sustain their living playing and he's been playing, you know, he's been in a, two bands since the late 70s. 
respect that. But yeah, and he's comfortable. He makes a living. He's not in debt. And, and that's, I think, I think for artists, that's, that's the goal. Yeah. I don't know about you, but when I started working in this industry, maybe because I was going through these phases, I always thought that if you didn't become an arena band, then you failed, which isn't the case because you have an artist. And I guess the one that always comes to mind for me is Rise Against. So like a really good example mm -hmm. of just a rock band who's pretty big in the US yeah. and they tour, they support their family, no ego, great people. And they go to Europe, they're almost yeah. headlining festivals. Like they make great money, stay out of the media. They're, they're just, I'm like, damn, that is the way to be. I respect it. It's basically, they go to work, they do their jobs, they go home. They love it too, I'm sure. Cause they got a good balance. Yeah, I mean, if you can do something like this in this business and you can get paid for it enough where you don't have to have a job outside of it, I can't see the need or for that want of that higher level. Probably comes with uh, some more downsides than you even anticipate. Oh yeah, I mean, there are definitely, I mean, there are definitely bands out there that should have quit a long time ago. But you know, I, I got offered a tour of my last company before I left, and. I, I just needed, I needed time off. I needed to go home. I just, you know, yeah. and they gave it to somebody else and the tour, I mean, it was an anniversary of one of their records, like yeah. their hit record and two shows in the entire tour was canceled because of low ticket sales. Oh God. That's yeah. unfortunate. It is unfortunate. That's hard for the ego. Okay. I was going to say that we, we got to the bandwagon and then we got caught up in talking because as we do, I wanted to know how you went from bandwagon mm -hmm. to buses because bus, correct me if I'm wrong, but in your timeline of kind of, or in your career path, is bus kind of the top? Yeah, bus is the okay. top. I mean, unless you want to jump up to like Bruce Dickinson and fly a plane everywhere for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that I think that's the only tier that's above this. Get rid of the wheels. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a natural, I mean, there are guys that are happy in bandwagons because, you know, it affords them the leisure of working whenever they want to work, you know, but with, with my company, you know, as much as right now, we're definitely going to be slammed with everything coming back. If I said, you know, I, Hey, we have this tour. And, you know, I said, I just, I need, you know, I need the time. I need like a month off to just regroup. Yeah. They wouldn't have a pro. They wouldn't have a problem. With it. You know, we, we have guys that will work every other tour because they have family and they want to be home to, to my company. Like they say, family is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Respect, which is good. And, and they want to make sure we're working, you know, the gentleman who books all our tours, he says, I'll work you as much as you want to work. You want to work 365? I'll find you work for 365. It's just, it, it's a good, it's a good atmosphere. Yeah. But getting into buses, I had met, I had met this, uh, I, I, he's a kid, he's younger than me. And his dad owned a bus company and his dad did the right thing and made him go work for a different bus company. <laughs> So it didn't look like favoritism and all that. And he, you know, he'd have somebody else as a boss to like, you know, not be like, oh, you're just the boss's son type. Deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just got here on uh, his wings or whatever the saying is. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, riding his coattails. Yeah, there we go. Wings, coattails, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, and his dad started getting sick and he knew he was going to take over the company. And he had been hounding me for a while to like, you know, go get my license. And, you know, he's like, I'll give you a job. I'll get you a seat. So... The only thing he asked me, he's like, listen, if like, I do this, you know, promise me you'll give me two years before you, you know, want to leave or whatever you want to do. So I said, all right, you know, that's that's fair enough. So in between tours with Bandwagon, I went and started like trying to get my license. You know, I had to get my I wanted to get my class A so I can pull a trailer, get my passenger endorsement. And it took me a while. I live in one of the harder states to get your license in because they're a little more strict and it's one of the only states that uses state troopers to test you. Oh goodness. Oh yeah. So if you're not already panicky to begin with and nervous, you know, looking in your mirror and seeing a state cop standing behind you does nothing to calm the nerves. So I, I did, I, I failed a couple times before I got my license and, you know, and then once I got my license, you know, he, I flew out to my company's base out of California. Mm -hmm. So I flew out there and, my first tour in a bus it was I flew out to L.A., went to the shop, got in a bus and drove to uh, Manhattan. Oh, you've, you've got a little uh, just a few days to get used to it, I guess. That's what they wanted you to, you know, figure out. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that first tour, it was, it was him and I, uh, my friend, the, you know, the now owner of the company. And, you know, we, you know, just drove across the country and the, the, the regulations were a little bit looser. It was before everything went electronic. So we could go a little bit further, you know, if we wanted to, we could just make it look like we went so far. We got to explain that though. I know what you mean, but nobody listening is going to mean. Can you explain the regulations real quick? 
So the regulations now, because of the DOT crackdown on all the trucking industry, and then they crack down on like the seated coaches, like your Greyhounds, your Peter Pans, and, and so forth. And then we were like the, the last stop. I can be on duty for 12 hours. And in those 12 hours, the maximum amount of driving that I can do is 10 hours. So once that time, once that 10 hours hits, I have to be parked and I cannot move that bus until eight hours clears for me to sleep before I can move the bus again. And this used to be written, right? So people could kind of do whatever they want. And now it's digital. Right. It's all digital now. Everything before was hand logs, which, you know, I mean, going back into like the heyday of bus driving, like guys would drive completely straight across the country, you know, in two days. Oh, wow. Just grind it out and, you know, get there and make a ton of money, you know, because you make, you know, you hit certain milestones for miles and you get more money, which is such an incentive. But it's harder now with all the regulations, but I, I still love it. I, you know, I, I, I love this job. It makes me happy to hear you're so happy and, and not that you shouldn't be, but there's obviously people who take jobs and then find the negatives and then dwell on those things, but you found the positives and. Oh, that, that was, that was roofing. Roofing was tough. <laughs> roofing was tough because every time I would go to leave, I would get more money. Oh yeah. And they'd be like, no, you can't leave. We're going to, we're going to give you a raise. Exactly. And then it got to the, you got, you get to that certain point where, you know, you're living off what you make. And all of a sudden it's like, I don't want to do this anymore. And you're looking at jobs and, you know, I mean, I'm talking the nineties. So it was like, you know, starting over a job for seven, $8 an hour was just soul crushing. It's hard. And I got, I got fortunate because out of 16 years, uh, I met and worked with who somebody who became my friend for about 13 of them. And we just went everywhere, company to company. We had fun every day. And that's what made it okay was the fact that I had fun every day. As much as, you know, I was grinding myself to a stump. I got paid to, to have a workout every day. I was in great shape. And I had fun with my friends. Yeah, that's great. What more could you ask for? It's like touring. Yeah, but once my body broke down, that was that was it. That's, that's yeah. where I had to end it. You got to adjust accordingly so that you can, you know, do your thing yeah. for a longer time. Yeah. Money's not worth it. I think we have a pretty good idea of how you got to driving a bus. And mm -hmm. now we get to get to some more good stuff where I want to know, like my experience on touring is I see the bus driver when I get on the bus at night and sometimes when I wake up in the morning, right? Like I see them. And then depending if we're in Europe or not, you know, they might be sleeping on the bus or they like, if it's a nicer tour, yeah. they might be making your bed. It, it, it changes depending on, you know, what level of tour you're on. And I'm sure there's mm -hmm. different tiers within the driving, but I wanted to know, I was trying to think of where we start your day. I think we should start your day at night because that's kind of the beginning of your day right yeah yeah all right cool yeah so you wake up at a hotel well rested hopefully and you have a drive that night on a tour what what's up How, how's it work me i i everybody's everybody's not everybody's different in this manner but there, there's two groups of people you have the people who shower before bed and you have the people who shower in the morning actually yeah. there's the third the people who do all three they shower <laughs> before bed they sleep they wake up the shower again yeah those are the people those are the people who like to be really clean they sweat while they sleep yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I do, but I mean, once I get warm, I just stick my foot on. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I just, I've never, I've never. I mean, I think that came from roofing. Like, I'd never like to go to bed dirty. Yeah. So I would always shower at night, you know, and so I go to bed, sleep the best I can. You know, there are days that, with anything and anybody in any kind of life, that you know, you have a hard time sleeping. Or the the biggest thing that I hate is falling asleep, and then that jump up panic that you overslept oh god and you and you look at your phone and it's only an hour later oh and then it's really hard to go back to sleep after in that panic mode those i mean i only had one where it was like four times in the, in the one night which mm -hmm. i was like come on seriously just stop <laughs> and, I, and i thought you know but there are days that are hard to sleep and you know i just i get up i get my stuff together depending on what time of the morning is i do that dreaded look to see if there's an uber anywhere close it's nicer if the hotel is closer uh, any management out there listening to this, it's always nicer when the hotel's closer. Closer to the venue. Closer to the venue. Because yeah. one, I mean, there are people out there that will take an Uber to go two blocks. But the majority of us will walk the two blocks. And the money that you saved booking a hotel two miles away, you're spending on an Uber anyways. Yeah. There and back to the hotel. I prefer to walk because it gives me that little bit of time to just, you know, wake up, clear the cobwebs. Because I'm a get up and go person. I yeah. will sleep to the last possible second and get out the door. So get get my Uber, get dressed, get all my stuff together, get my Uber, 
mm-hmm. looked around the room about a hundred times for that idiot check. Yeah, yeah. That that any touring person knows that you look under you look in places that you didn't put anything just to make yeah. sure nothing <laughs> fell. Because that, that dreaded feeling of being five miles down the road and you realize something's missing. Hopefully it's not the keys to your bus somehow. Yeah. So I, I will get to my I'll get to my bus and you know I'll do my, my pre-chip check. So I look at everything, I look at the tires, I check my belts, I check my fluids, make sure everything is good to go, which I also do at the end of the, at the end of the drive. Just to make sure nothing. So it's kind of like a double check every day. This way, nothing's leaking, nothing cracked overnight. You know, check my tires, check the trailer, and then I'll I'll get the bus fired up. You know, let it warm up for a good twenty minutes. Make sure everybody is settled down. If the party is raging. You know, let them just shut the door. Let them have their fun. Yeah, and just to, I know this is really simple to us, but there's a door between the driver and the rest of the bus. That's the door he's talking about. He doesn't leave the front door open while he drives. Yeah, um, yeah. So no, no. A- <laughs> and, and, and even that, even then, even then, sometimes. Sometimes, the, sometimes the door, sometimes it's a curtain. Yeah. So <laughs> curtains a little harder because I mean, I like the curtain more because air flows through when I stay a little bit cooler, but the door is nicer because you know, it just keeps everybody separate. Even if they fall over, they're going to bounce off the door. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll get everything set. I get my GPS set and get ready to go. You know, if they're in bed, I'll do a once over through the front lounge, make sure nothing's going to fall off the counter because I have had things fall off the counter. Yeah, bottles of alcohol, toasters. Oh, you don't think they're going to, but sometimes they do. Even if they're stored all the way in the back, somehow you hit a bump the right way and it goes flying. Buses always put that no-slip carpet stuff underneath the appliances so they don't move around. It's cool. On on one tour, you know, I I took a corner and I heard something bump and fall. And I'm like, you know, what could that be? I'm thinking like, I knew there was a candle near one of the edges. I'm like, and then all of a sudden I smelled cinnamon. I'm like, all right, it was a candle. And then I realized it was a river running down my stairs. Oh, no. Of hot wax? No, no, no. Even worse than hot wax. I would have taken hot wax at that point. It was one of the bigger size, brand new, not even open bottle of Fireball. Fireball. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. That's all sugar. That's all sugar. It hit the floor and it shattered. I had a slide out, so it went underneath the slide out. Yeah. And it just smelled so bad of cinnamon. And a slide out, quick, def- de- we're getting a lot of terms here. A slide out, you explain it. I don't need to explain it. So, What's a slide uh, yeah, out? A, a slide out is when you walk in the bus, you have, you know, uh, a section of wall that will actually, for lack of a better term, slide out <laughs> to give you more room in that front lounge. So you're not just, you know, squeezing by each other. It gives you like more of a dance floor, I guess. And it's only when the bus is parked. Yep. And sometimes buses have double slide outs. So they'll have one in the back lounge too, but that's like yeah. pretty nice. That's that's uber fancy. Yeah, that's pretty nice. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then I you know I get myself ready to go, and then depending on how I feel, I'll I'll schedule myself a stop. You know, within probably like the first hour, because if people are awake, it's easier to get that hour for them to you know go to bed. So that way, if I stop to get coffee, uh, I don't have you know seven seven passengers flying around the the, the truck stop, and I have yeah. to keep count of who's where and where's who, and then open curtains to make sure everybody made it back. You got to play babysitter because the tour manager is probably asleep or something. Usually is. Uh, sometimes it's tour manager, sometimes the tour manager, you know, for, you know, first awake, last to bed. That's, you know, that's a good tour manager, but it's hard. I've done it. And I don't expect that of the tour managers on the tour because I've been that guy and I hated that. Yeah. Especially when your band stays up till 4am or something. It's like, it just, yeah, I, I, I did a reggae tour. Oh wow. Now, you would think you would think a reggae tour would be sleeping a lot. <laughs> So one of them would wake up about 7 a.m. and he would do dabs. Dabs for the... the uh, we might have to define what dabs are, to be honest. Dabs for the, the unhip crowd or what do you want to call it or, you know... Not California-based? Not Calif- <laughs> they were California-based. is basically, you know, marijuana in its finest form of a waxy substance. It's a very concentrated weed. It's almost like a hard drug, to be honest. I mean, it starts... Yeah, it's waxy and it just... It just boy. So he would get up at seven o'clock and start that. And throughout the day, they would wake up, they would do their sound checks, they would do their shows. And then there was a re- revolving cast of like three or four that would stay up until about five in the morning, drinking, smoking, and just partying. That would be about two hours of like quiet for every day. That's all I would get out of the bus. That is crazy. So it's just like, because there's eight people on there and they're kind of rotating their sleep schedules, some people are awake and asleep. And how does it work on buses like, with smoking weed, like, I mean, I know the, my experience when I've been on them, but is it the bus driver's choice or do bands are just like, we're smoking on here? Like, what's the vibe there? Um, 
It, it, it really depends. I mean, I'm, it, it's going it, to, regardless, you're going to have people, even if you ask them not to, you're going to have people that do. Smoking cigarettes is, is never allowed, but I've definitely come back to the bus and there's, you know, drunk sitting there smoking cigarettes in the front lounge. And it's kind of like, come on, guys, just go outside. And, and usually people smoke weed in the back lounge, right? That's like, I mean, maybe not on the reggae tour. It sounds like everywhere was a weed smoking yeah, area. But yeah. Everywhere, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they try, they, try to, they try to keep it in the back, you know, where they can open, you know, while we're parked, they can open the window and they can keep it out of the bunk area. I mean, it all depends. Like sometimes you have people that party mix with people that don't. Mm-hmm. You know, you have some that are just so professional, like the show's over, their job's done for the day. They're in their bunk trying to watch a movie and fall asleep mm-hmm. while everybody else is partying. It's just it's just different vibes sometimes. But I mean, I, I've been lucky for the most part touring with who I've toured with that I haven't really had any problems, especially in buses. I haven't really had any problems in buses. It was mostly all bandwagon. Yeah. Do you, do you think that like I'm trying to think of the times when I was on tour and we had problems with drivers or when I say we, I mean, not me. I'm the photographer, like the artist <laughs> I'm with or something. I'm like, this driver has to go. Yeah. Like, I don't care at all. Like, I'm just like, if they're safe driver, whatever. But I'm trying to think like, do you think your lack of problems with artists is a reflection of kind of how you handle everything or maybe even just how you hold yourself? Do you think that, or why do you think that artists have problems with drivers and what are those problems that could happen? Well, I mean, you definitely have... I mean, you have a cross section of drivers from all walks of life. A lot of them yeah. are former truck drivers. You know, they grew up in a different era. You know, just different backgrounds, different beliefs, different. You know, it can you can run the gamut. Yeah, just different types of people existing together. Dif- different types of people, which is why, like, with the whole, you know, trying to make sure that my friends work and driving and encouraging them to move up or change careers and drive or whatever to build a better you know, baseline of drivers that, you know, come from the business. Yeah. You know, there's at, at star alone, there's that I know of this three of us that were have toured in one capacity or another. So, so you're saying that, and this is kind of cool because some people listen to this podcast, might tour already, or maybe are thinking about touring. You're saying that it can be a continuation of your touring career to be like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to be a driver now. Absolutely. A- absolutely. Because it comes down to either you're going to, you're going to walk away from touring because like your band didn't work. I mean, how many, how many people do you know that have transitioned from bands into tech? Yeah. yeah. Tons. And those are, and those are the best people to have as techs. Yeah. People who know what's needed for stage every night and they're, and they're keeping their, it keeps their little piece of dream alive because they're still connected with that stage. Yeah. They're still helping the show happen. Yep. They're still making everything happen. And that can go all the way from the drum tech, the guitar tech, you know, your stage manager, your your AV guy, you know, your your sound guy, everything all the way to a driver. Any bit of, con- you know, connection with that world, and you're still a part of that world and you're, you're, you're you know, you're being active in it. I mean, I like I said, I, I love touring from the moment I jumped in a van and to be able to still do it, you know, is incredible. It's not exactly what we envisioned for ourselves. <laughs> But for most of us, we're realists and we know that not everybody makes that dream, but we're still attached to what we love. You know, honestly, through this podcast, I've had a few moments where I was like, I think I need to start driving. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're doing such a good job. Like, I don't even like, I just started driving long distances recently during COVID and got good at it. But prior to that, I was like the worst thing ever. And I'm like, I think that this sounds like almost like a meditation, like get in your bus, you have your stuff and you just go. It yeah. sounds so nice. You know, I, I, a friend of mine put it one way, you know, cause we were talking and, you know, talking how, and anybody who's in this business is a little bit off, <laughs> a little bit special. Yeah. We're, we're, we're a touch on the spectrum Yeah, and, you know, and it's like, because I mean, we do things that people look at us and go, why, you know, and we're talking, you know, we're just talking one day, just, you know, kind of bullshit and have a good time. And, you know, I, I joked and said, you know, we're a little bit crazy. He's like, well, we are crazy. Yeah. And so well, what, what degree do you make us crazy? He's like, listen, as drivers, we stare out through a windshield into the darkness for hours on end. Sometimes we forget to listen to music. Yeah. And we're just within our own heads. He's like, that's psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right, fair enough. Because I have. I have had drives where like I'm seven hours in and I'm like realizing like I'm not listening. I'm not listening to anything. You're just zoning. You're just zoning. You're in the, in the zone. Yeah. Staring at the darkness. But, but bring us, bring us back to track, you know? So then, you know, I, I, you know, I get us moving to the next destination. 
you know, wherever it may be, you get a little bit of anxiety when you get into tighter cities, you know, because, because anything can happen, you know, a car pulls out, you know, unexpectedly, you're going down the highway, you know, traffic starts backing up. You have cars or trucks that forget to think that this, you know, monstrous vehicle doesn't stop on a dime, you know, and you don't really don't want to jack on the brakes too hard and send everybody in their bunk sliding to the front of the bunk. Yeah. Wake everybody up. They think something. Yeah. So yeah, you don't want to make anybody nervous. Bigger like cities like like that are tight, like Chicago, New York, you know, just Boston, just just cities that are tight, lots of cars, Philly. It can be a little nerve wracking. Yeah. The wor- the worst thing for a driver is three words, uh, drop and go. Yeah. You want to explain that? Because I know what that is. Yeah. It's pretty common on tour, but explain what a drop and go is. A drop and go is, uh, like I said, a driver's nightmare because you pull in. Uh, the best example I can give is the TLA in Philadelphia. You're pulling up onto a packed street where nobody looks where they're going. You're pulling up in front of the venue. They take all the gear out of your trailer and then you leave. And the people out of the bus usually. And the people out of the bus, everybody, <laughs> everybody, everybody up and out. And you have to drive and have and park wherever they, you know, request that you park. Hotel, Walmart, whatever. Now you're thinking, that's not that stuff doesn't sound too, too bad. Except for now, you know, most hotels. And this, I will offend this to a thousand percent. The the biggest lie ever told is when you call a hotel or you get to a hotel and you can see the parking lot and they, you know, you see if you can check in early, especially on drop and goes so you can get to bed. And they say, oh, I'm sorry, we're full last night. We don't have any rooms. You can't check until four o'clock. If that happens, you don't call them on it and say, listen, just give me any room. There, there's ways that you can force their hand a little bit, you know, like you pull up with the bus. <laughs> No, no, take, take take your shoes off, fall asleep on the couch. They'll find your room real quick. Yeah, yeah, in the lobby? In the lobby, right yeah. where everybody can see you. So, you know, you, you get in your hotel room at 4 o'clock, you know, you get yourself wound down, shower, hopefully in bed by 5 o'clock, and you have to be back at the bus for 11 to bring it back over to pick everything back up. Yeah, and that's for a drop and go? Yeah, that's a, that's a drop and go. So you really don't get the complete sleep that you need. And it's not the best, but it happens. It's it's becoming more of a rarity. Thank you, you know, thankfully. Especially because of the digital now, right? You can't fib the the times and everything. Yeah, it's getting less and less. Like there there are a lot less venues that have that. A lot more venues are actually paying for the permits for you to park outside, or you get lucky and you just take up street parking and you don't get. I mean, if you get a ticket, it's better to get the ticket and not get sleep. It's it's a fair trade. So, but yeah, so you know, get you get to the city and you know. If you do have venue parking, which is beloved, I get parked, I get leveled, make sure the bus, you know, sits nice and, and square for everybody. And then I'll like go through the front lounge, pick up some trash, wipe stuff down, quiet as possible so people can sleep. You're not vacuuming. <laughs> no, I mean I have I have a broom. I mean, if it's bad, I'll I'll wait until later when people are up and go back and vacuum, but I'll yeah. I'll sweep everything out the best I can. And then once everybody's awake, I can go back and, you know, take care of bunk alley in the back lounge. Tidy up, tidy up, and make it you know nice as can be. So your job as a bus driver is not only to maintain the the ability of the of the bus to operate, but the inside of the bus. Is there anywhere where drivers kind of draw the line? Like, is there an expectation from artist or crew, whoever you're driving, to kind of have like obviously spilled fireball over the floor? Like, do you require them to clean up on any level if they party hard every night? Or are you still responsible? I will be when when I something that carried over from my construction career was I would always, myself and my friend would always go to, you know, the super of the job site. And I would do this with TMs. I would say, what can I do to make your job easier? Because that's going to make my job easier. Yeah. Happy TM, happy driver. Yeah, exactly. You know, and my, and the only thing I say is if something, if something isn't right or if something is broken, I can't fix it or do anything about it unless you tell me Like communication is key between us. So that's what the TM tells you, or that's what you tell them? That's, I that's just... what I tell the TM. I say okay. communication is key. Because there have been drivers that, you know, will get a phone call from their office saying, you know, this is broken. They're complaining about this, but yet they've never talked to you. Yeah, you didn't even know it was broken. Like Exactly. The, they go right over the You don't go turn on the TV head. every day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, I go in and I wipe down the counters, I wipe down the seats. You know, I try to make it, you know, smell nice and smell good because it, it's their home. That's where they, they eat, they sleep. You know, it's their home. and for me to take 20 minutes, half an hour to just make sure, I mean, I get paid for it. Don't get me wrong, but to but take that, take that time to make sure that it's, it's a comfortable setting, you know, is everything. 
I mean, yeah. as somebody who rode on a bus, you know that a, a clean bus is as it's a lot easier to deal with than look walking in like, you know, seeing a mess every day. Yeah. Well, somebody who's experienced a clean bus, my myself, I'm, I'm saying, I kind of am happy I'm having this conversation because in a way, I think I kind of took it for granted and I just didn't realize how much work was going in on behalf of the driver or the TM. I just kind of woke up and was like, this is a nice bus. And I, <laughs> I, I do think that to an extent, like as I toured with artists that were older and older and less destructive, it became easier for them to maintain, but it, it does make a difference. And it, I think for somebody who hasn't toured, you can equate it to just like cleaning your house or your apartment before you go on a vacation and then coming home to that clean place and how it feels. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. You know, you wake up and it's dirty. It just, it starts your day off wrong. Yep. Such day off wrong. And you know, I I've had cases where, you know, it becomes an everyday where I come in, I there's simple things like if the trash gets full and I'm not there, I'm at the hotel, take the trash out. You know, you don't just, I mean, think through the days of like the chute, which is basically like you open a cabinet, you throw stuff in and it goes down a chute to a barrel under the bus are fading out because that is some of the grossest shit possible. People don't think, and they just keep stuffing stuff down there. One time we got locked out of a bus and, um, I made my way <laughs> into the bus. Uh, we were in Canada and our driver was gone and I don't remember if I actually got in or just got stuck and then we got it out, but it was disgusting. Oh, it's absolutely disgusting. So I'm thankful that, but I mean like simple stuff like that, like, you know, what? if you're, if you're in there and it's six o'clock in the afternoon and yeah. the trash is full, take two seconds to take the trash out. Yeah. Do the damn thing. Yeah. I mean, I've had, I've come back and like day after day, it's just been an absolute mess. Water bottles everywhere. Like the, the biggest menace for anybody listening, the biggest menace on a tour bus are shoes everywhere. Oh yeah. All right. The shoe hack where, all right. Where do you think the best, I have my own opinion, but I want to know your opinion. Where do people, should people put their shoes? It depends. If you have people who are reasonable and have maybe two pairs of shoes for themselves, that's easy. Are you on the artist bus or the crew bus? That's the, that's the either key. or, <laughs> either or, you know, um, you know, you can basically get the, a shoe rack that hangs in the back of a door and you can do, I mean, like right now, the artists that I have, I have 10 people on my bus Yeah, and the drawers under the couches, those are where all the shoes are. Yeah. I like that. Ne neatly, neatly put away. I've, I've had both. I mean, I've had the back closet stuff full of shoes. There's a, okay. Let me see if I can explain this. So bunks are usually tiered six on each side in rows of three. And on some buses, there's thing called condo bunks, which yep. correct me if I'm wrong, but what they basically do is they take the middle bunk and they slide it down on top of the bottom bunk. And then they cut the, the space there. So there's kind of like two bunks down there or do they remove it usually? So where you have the, the three, the two yeah. bars and to make the three, they'll take one of them out and slide either one up or one down to make equal space between the two. Yeah, and your bunk gets bigger. But the cool thing is then you have this little like space there. And I've seen people just shove their shoes in there at the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it kind yeah. of sticks out. So if yeah. you're on a, some kind of nicer bus, condo bunks, then there's only eight people max on there then you could do that too. But that's usually if you're an artist or something. Oh man. I was just thinking about shoe situation. Yeah. I mean, and then you, and then you get the, and you, and then you get the next tier up where you have the, they, they call it a star car where you have the bed in the back. Oh yes. We should, I'll, I'll probably have to do a diagram of a bus. So of course there's a level of like, you just get to be on a bus, right? An artist works their whole mm -hmm. career, their van, bandwagon bus. But then once you get to a bus, obviously there's different subcategories. And could you maybe do like a few minute explanation of kind of where it starts and then as an artist gets bigger or like you know some of these tours have like 10 20 buses on them how the buses change i i did a tour summer before the pandemic where we had five buses on the tour uh, without naming it and we've been making it very obvious it was uh, an acapella group and one would think that an acapella group wouldn't need five buses but they were on one bus and the other four buses was a mix of crew and catering oh they really like food well, the catering only took up like, half, I mean, I had the catering on my bus, but it was only, the crew was only half of the bus, you know, and I yeah. had like the, the audio guys and the photographer and, and, you know, and everything else was just the rest, like three other buses were just crew. And it's just, it, it's crazy sometimes to know what goes into production. You know, I, I worked for that catering company as a driver twice, once in a bus, once in a bandwagon and the, the bandwagon tour, I mean, I'll say I, it was for Kiss, which was a weird and phenomenal tour, but Kiss themselves even the four of them flying with their tour manager and all that, they still had five buses for crew. It's just that level is just madness to me. It's so much. Yeah. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Yeah. The, the level of those tours is just insane. And 
So, I mean, so the buses start with usually 12 people on them, right? And then like, yes. what would you say the next nicer tier is of a bus? So you would start with the, you would start with the 12. It depends on, I mean, it, it really does come down to what you have as far as the artist and crew. You know, you get into the realm of like a hip hop tour, mm -hmm. you know, you have less moving parts. So you can do, you can get away with having, you know, condo bunks on one side for the artist. You know, even in one tier, having, you know, if say there's two artists, you know, they each have a condo bunk and it still leaves them nine bunks per crew. I see what you're saying. So you, you go from there. And then from there, you can do two, you know, one condo, one set of condos, two set of condos up to four. So you mean this, you will go from 12 bunks to eight bunks. From there, you would jump back to having condo bunks or just 12 bunks again. And an artist has a bed in the back, in the back lounge. And then there's a scenario where it's just the artist. Like, is there a scenario where it's just the bed and then everything else is like, it's just like a giant hotel room, basically? Does that get to be a point or are those custom? I think that's more custom. You know, I think that I think that falls into the realm of like, you know, an artist having enough money to buy their own bus. OK. Corn was at that level because Jonathan Davis had like a recording studio built into his bus. You know, it just depends on how much it depends on how much money you have and what you want to spend and what you want to take with you. Yeah. How often you tour? Are you bringing yeah. your family out? Is this yeah. like a motor home? You know, I think like yeah. an example would be Travis Barker, who just didn't fly forever. You know, he's always bringing his family out, always living on a bus. Um, it might make more sense. Yeah. Sorry. I, can I, can I, I want to circle back real fast to driving because yeah. we kind of just said, and then I drive all night. What's it like getting in there <laughs> and driving all night? Like I asked, uh, we have like a group of people that kind of pay to support the show, the patrons. Thank you guys. But their main question was, how do you stay up all night? Is that something you had to work on or is it just something you're perfectly good at now? What's that like driving all night? It, it's funny. Cause I have, I actually have a good, I have a good funny story about that. Oh, well, let's hear it. Myself and a, uh, a friend of mine both were driving bandwagons. Uh, him and I were talking. This is, in, you know, when him and I were both doing Warped Tour, and it probably like in 2014. And this other driver came up. We're just kind of standing there for a minute. He's like, can I ask you guys a question? And we're like, yeah, sure. He's like, what do you guys do to stay awake? I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> He's like, well, what, do you, what do you do to stay awake all night? I just look at him and I go, I get, I get sleep. I got a good night's rest. He's like, well, I mean, do you like, do you like energy drinks or coffee? I'm like, I might get a coffee. He's like a coffee. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> like, I, I don't need. It's not my fuel. <laughs> and you know, and, and as far as energy drinks, I'm like, you know, once I realized how terrible they were for me and they, they, you know, they basically go into your body and they come out the same color. That to me was enough to stop drinking them. Yeah. So, and he just kind of went, huh? Okay. And he walked away. And my friend, I just kind of looked at you like, that was, that was really weird. And flash forward a couple of years, you know, this kid and I, you know, we became friends and he was, him and I were on a tour together, a reggae tour, go figure. And we were going into Canada and I wanted to stop and get fuel before going into Canada. So he's like, I have enough fuel. I should be all right. So we both pull into the gas station so we can, do, so we can cross together. And I get out, I walk around, see what number the pump is, walk back around my bus to go inside to pay. And I see him like leaning against the window and I asked him, watch your like slip into that deep sleep. He fell asleep standing at the gas station? No, no. He was in his seat and he was just leaning up against the window. But I saw, I mean, literally like overuse that word. Everybody does. I got off the bus enough time to walk around the front, see what number it was, walk back around, walk towards his bus. So 30 seconds. Yeah. And I watched him sink into that deep sleep. And I was like, he's out. He's going to kill somebody. So I'm like, all right. So I walk in, I prepaid my fuel. I walk back out. He's still sitting there. I, I go over and I start my pump. I turn around. He's standing behind me. I'm like, I'm like, I just watched your soul leave your body. <laughs> he's like, what? I'm like, I just watched you go into the deepest sleep a human should exist to have. Yeah. It, it just, there isn't any deeper sleep besides a coma. I'm like, are you all right? He's like, oh, I feel fine. I just stuck for like two minutes. I'm like, no. <laughs> That'd be so scary being a passenger and going up and be like, our driver's asleep right now. <laughs> I, he I mean, he never fell asleep driving. Like it was just like he, whenever he could catch like two minutes, he would take two minutes. It was the uh, most bizarre thing. I will say I can relate to this driver. However, I am not a driver, but as a photographer, you know, I'm with on artist schedule. A lot of the times when we're driving to a venue, I'm out for 10 minutes. I got to catch my sleep where I can because artists are psychos, but like, yeah, I, I'm not a driver. So I, I think I can do it, but yeah, yeah it is wild. Yeah, you're allowed. You're allowed. <laughs> But no, I just, I make sure that I try That's to get enough, enough, enough sleep as possible. Yeah. You know, and everybody has those days where they don't sleep well. 
You know, it's just, it's a lot different because I'm responsible for not only my life, but the life of, you know, 12, you know, or more people. Oh, and yeah. actually there is, there is that tier of us that, that we didn't talk about. That's absolutely dreadful. Is this where there's more than 12 people? Correct. How's that work? So, and this happened like in the early years of Warp Tour, because you know, you're, you're, if you're a crew for Warp Tour, you're really not on the bus a lot. The production buses? You put production, but you're, you're there to sleep. And then you you get out and you go build stages or whatever yeah, it is you yeah. do. So they would take the back lounge out and add six more bunks. Oh my God. That's so many people. 18. 18 people on a bus trying to use the bathroom, the front lounge, or just use the hall, like the, the, the walkway to get in and out. Yeah, it's too much. That's crazy. Yeah, but you know, you got to save that money. And you're right. Warp Tour is you're barely on the bus. I've seen it too yeah. where they like have four in a row or maybe my memory is wrong. I swear on warp tour, like some band had four bunks, but I could just, it could have been like an older bus with different dimensions, less bass space. You yeah. could, because with like with bandwagon, they set it up as eight. You can do it as nine. They just get rid of the one condo bunk. I did a tour and it was like preemptive karma. Yeah. It was one of the band. It was one of the bands. I just, I had a miserable time with, um, uh, they were just miserable people. Like, they, they're happy go lucky, but they were just miserable human beings. Yeah. Like they were not, they were not kind to, to others. Yeah. They were on the, they were in that part of their career where they're going down or going up and something's going on. Yeah. And they, they asked for uh, a nine bunk bandwagon. Yeah. And I, you know, I just jumped in it real quick when I left bandwagon and I went and to drove to Dallas and I picked them up and all of a sudden uh, they're getting in they're loading all their stuff. And I hear what the fuck. So I'm like, oh, what's broken already? They just yeah. got in it. And I went in and I don't know why, but I saw what happened. I, I saw what they were upset about. I walked off the wagon. I walked away and I started laughing <laughs> because for some reason they didn't take the condo out, but they put four bunks on one side. <laughs> and the, the smallest one was big enough that the, 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 the you, you could like get in it, but you had to slide in it. It's like a coffin there wasn't enough room to turn over. Oh my gosh. That'd be so rough. <laughs> oh, it was, I, I just had to walk away and I, and I called the owner. I said, really four bunks on. And I guess they had, I don't know if they had problems before. He just started laughing. Oh my God. <laughs> Got him. But yeah, I mean, go, I mean, going back to cleaning, like, you know, I, I make I, I like to make sure that their, their home is their home, you know? And when it comes to, you know, the bunks themselves, I like to give the option of, I can either pull the sheets you know, and make the beds or I will put fresh sheets out. You put your dirty sheets in a bag and I stay out of your, your space. Yeah. Whatever you want. Because sometimes people get real, you know, fidgety about their space. Yeah. It's, it's their one place on tour that they can call their own. That's all their own. And I, I mean, like I said, I don't have a problem making people's beds, but I would prefer that they handle their world yeah. as they would at home, you know? Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> Hopefully they handle their home well. <laughs> yeah, you hope so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I've, I've had tours where I've I've changed uh, I've changed the sheets for the for the crew, and I've had to move mountains out of the bunk to get the mattress out to change the sheet to put it back, and just like almost shovel to suck back in the bunk. Yeah, there's just so much stuff in their bunk. You know, I can say apologies for those people, but I will say <laughs> that I am one of them, and I yeah. just tell the drivers usually because I'm the photographer and. I have a lot of gear that's expensive Yes. and maybe to a fault, I'm like, I'm not putting this in a bay. I'm not putting this in a back lounge. I'm putting all my lenses on my computer at the bottom of my bunk and I'm sleeping uncomfortably, maybe a little bit just yep. so I can sleep better knowing that nobody's breaking my stuff except for me. Yeah. But I can't defend anybody else. It's probably just clothes. Clothes are, are you know, 1500 dirty socks that are just stuffed at the bottom of the bunk because they kick them off in the night and they forget that they're there. <laughs> <laughs> They throw them away, buy new ones. Yeah, you know, put them on the rider. That's uh, any band that's listening. Any band that's listening. When you can get a rider, put a pack of fresh socks on that rider, and you will thank me to the day you stop touring. Because there's yeah. nothing like putting on clean socks, brand new. And if you can get a brand new pair of socks every day, you live a happy life. Yeah, I mean, it's a better way. I'd rather spend ten bucks on socks than four different types of Doritos that you're not going to eat. You know? It, exactly. Get the 12 pack spurs. Get one prepared for everybody. All right. Well, you got a lot of good tips from this episode. I do actually have a question that's been on my list this whole time. You've got to explain to me why you can't shit on a bus and if it's really the grinder or if it's a, like, tell me the 
why you can only pee on the bus and no solids and how like like the, what the process is to unload that like i really just want to know what's going on there if i'm getting lied to it, it's it's harder to do because time wise it, it's a lot harder i mean rvs are set up for that where you run a hose into it i mean you're not always going to have a hose to run into it to help clean the system out so i mean you get a back build of of all of that and it just makes it a lot easier to just take care of it and go. And then instead of, you know, you might have a deadline to get to A to B and the tank and the tank is full and it's going to take you 45 minutes to make sure that the, the tank is flushed. Yeah. Cause you have to like actually clean it out. It's not just liquid is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard for solids. I mean, even with the grinder, it's hard for solids to break down. Okay. You know, and then, you know, you have a tank that, you know, maybe didn't empty all the way and you get back fumes and now your bus smells like poo. And nobody wants a bus that smells like poop. It's everybody. So it's basically in everybody's best interest just to not do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I have no problem. Like, you know, I, I, last night was the perfect example. We, we hit the road. Uh, I stopped at Bucky's. Uh, for those who don't know, Bucky's is a, a gas station in Texas. That is like the Walmart of gas stations. It's amazing. Okay. You, can, you can get beef jerky. You can get, you know, a brisket sandwich. You can buy the best t-shirts ever. Best t-shirts ever. You can buy, yeah. a, you know, a stuffed beaver. And so three of three of them were still up, you know, at, at that point, and they were excited because I have a band from the UK. That's this is their first tour here, so they've heard about they've they've heard about it, and they were excited. And, you know, they went and they're like taking pictures in Bucky's of like stuff that they <laughs> saw, and it was it was fun. About a, about an hour hour and a half later, one of them got up and was like, uh, "Can we hit a rest stop?" I'm like, "Yeah, what's up?" He's like, "I need a rest stop." I'm like, "Ah," uh, I'm like, "Yeah, let me see what let me see what I can find." Yeah. And I would rather I would rather make a stop for somebody to run in and, and take care of business than have to clean out a tank every day. I, I mean, I, I'm in that category too. Uh, a few years back, I had my gallbladder removed, which is until you figure out what you can and cannot eat, it's like playing Russian roulette with your stomach. You're like, all righty. What did I you have to keep a notebook of like what you ate? Yeah, well, not a notebook what you ate. You just you you remember not to. You know, yeah. not to eat. I've been on the, the the better end of it all where I haven't had a lot of things affect me. I mean, I've read horror stories where like people can't have their favorite food anymore because it just goes right through them. Uh, my worst thing is like I can't have milk when I wake up in the morning. Yeah, like, I, I can't have milk on an empty stomach. And for the world of too much information, I forgot that rule one day <laughs> coming out of Canada. Canada, as for those who travel, know like the treats and the drinks are different. You know, their, their candy is different They're You know, they just got stuff that we don't have, which is in some cases amazing. And they have a chocolate milk that tastes like Rolos. Yeah. A chocolate milk that tastes like um, a Nestle's crunch bar. And I, I picked up a couple, woke everybody up, make sure they're awake for the border. And I drank one. And as I was rolling up to the border, there were three trucks in front of me. And all of a sudden my stomach rumbled and I went, Oh dear God, no, 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 no. And I was sweating trying to get through the border and to a truck stop as fast as humanly possible. They're like, this guy looks sketchy. Let's talk to him. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've, I've definitely had some fun border crossings. I've had bad border crossings. Some that just didn't make sense of how we got through. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I toured with an Australian band. And while we were sitting in customs, there was one of them sitting on the floor, another one sitting in the chair behind him, and another standing behind him. And they were giving each other shoulder rubs in the middle of <laughs> in the middle of the, the room, while two others were playing hacky sack in the in the immigration room. This has to be Parkway Drive. No, no, hands like houses. It. Oh, okay, I know those guys too. I, this is fine. That's not so negative. I was going to say Parkway Drive always does the weird stuff that makes sense, but I would never do myself. And I'm I, yeah, exactly. And they're and they're great guys. You know, they're absolutely those guys are great. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, we're we're not going to get let into Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and I was the I was the only one they called over. Yeah. And they grilled me and they're like, all right, you're good to go. And I turn around and look at the circus going on behind me. I'm like, <laughs> and I get grilled. And yeah, they're yeah. walking out, they're walking out, and and everyone's like, Oh yeah, they love Australians. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey man, just play hacky sack at the border. That's the tip yeah. right there. So oh my God. yeah, I know it's just I just like to I just like to make sure that everybody's comfortable. You know, I'll ask people in the morning how was the sleep. And if I know the roads are rough and construction zones are the worst you know and you get all that the bumps the, the twirl you hit the you hit the rumble strip that's in the middle of the road for no reason you're like it wasn't me i swear i step so listen you'll know if it's me if it's if it's longer than 30 seconds yeah yeah but it'll never it'll never be me 
you know, I just want to make sure everybody's comfortable. And I, I think the biggest compliment like a driver can get is I had a passenger that couldn't sleep while the bus was moving. Like just, he couldn't sleep. He just he oh, refused goodness. to go to bed. He would, you know, sit on the couch and it just, it was rough on him because he just anxiety over it. Yeah. And we had a late bus call. It was a short drive. So we had a late bus call and you know, I got there, I got everything done. I got, I drove all the way there, did everything I needed to do. I was parked and I was just starting to pick stuff up. And he comes out of Funk Alley and he was like, what time are we leaving? You're like we're here. I'm like, you, I'm like, I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, what time are we leaving for the event for the next venue? I said, we're here. Yeah. He's like, what? I'm like, did you actually sleep on this ride? He's like, yeah. He's like, I haven't done that in years. Oh, because you drove some. That's great. And he was happy. And he was happy. And like, it kind of broke it. I mean, he had nights that he still stayed up all night, but there were nights that he actually got to sleep. It was in his head. It was, yeah, exactly. And he was thankful, you know? And that to me, that's the biggest compliment is you have, you have people that have a hard time sleeping that actually sleep. You're like, my work here is done. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. Well, man, I feel like we covered everything. Like we got to how you, how you got to where you're at, what it's like to do your job, a few tips and tricks. I mean, we went pretty deep in that and hopefully when people tour on a bus, they'll now respect, like, not that they wouldn't, but they'll know what the driver's doing while they're sleeping and kind of understand. I mean, that's the idea of the podcast is that all these people that work and do these things on tour that you don't actually know about now, you know, so hopefully you can work better with them and be a better yeah. person on tour. And, and, and for the world out there, the, the creation of podcasts has helped drivers immensely. Oh yeah. You can only listen to the same music so many times, even if it's your most favorite band in the world. You don't want to, you don't want to get it to the point where you hate it. So podcasts have definitely helped, you know, and it could be a myriad of anything like, you know, educational. I listen to like audio books. I've listened to audio books, you know, and just, it's great because I mean, if you know the story, you've already got it. I have one I've listened to like five or six times. Oh, that's great. What is it? Uh, Ready Player One. How's the movie hold up to the book? Not completely different, but Uh different. Okay. It's an updated um, version, I'm sure. The was Ready Player One older. Well, I mean, it was it was with the author, and you know, 2011, not that old. He he crafted it towards you know being a movie, so they could slim it down to what it needed to be. It okay. very easily could have been like a two part movie. Okay. I tried reading it, but because it a lot of it is you know through like in game texting and stuff like that, you know, it makes it a little bit hard. And listening to it made it great because it was read by Will Wheaton. Okay. Wesley Crusher from Star Trek. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. And he actually like changed his voice for parts and it, it, it he read it beautifully. Like he, can, he did an amazing job. Can you imagine doing a whole read through of a book, man? That's hard work. It, it's, and there are, there are people out there that have read like Tim Curry, like after Tim Curry started his health decline, he read, he's read an amazing amount of like audiobooks. So there are people out there that just make a second living off of it. Respect to them. I'm sure drivers appreciate it. And without and without stuttering their words or, you know, probably taking yeah. two or three hundred takes to do a one word. But no, it, it, it's helpful. Podcasts, like I said, you know, they're essential for drivers who just have nothing else that they care to listen to and destroy in their mind. Well, are you going to listen to this podcast of yourself talking? <laughs> are you that be might like, be, it's hard for people to do. That might be a little weird because, I mean, with everybody, you, you don't know what your voice sounds like until you hear it. Oh, my God. And, it's a hard and, one. And half the Oh, I'm sure. And half times you're like, oh, that's what I sound like. Before I got somebody else to edit it for me, it was a rough oh editing my God. process. Just going through and listening, I was like, oh, already then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I put too much tone on that one. Too much inflection. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if not, you can just give it to the other drivers, you know. Hey, listen yeah. to me. Talk about what we do. <laughs> I, we do have a question we ask everybody. But I don't know if it makes sense for you because you get hotels. But if you shower at venue, oh yeah, you toured other ways before. Are you shower shoes, no shower shoes kind of guy? <laughs> the answer, the answer is no shower shoes. But for the longest time, like I, it's weird growing up in like the hardcore metal scene. Yeah. And whenever I could take my shoes off, my shoes are off. My last spring, summer, fall of roofing, I worked barefoot. Really? Yeah. You're like straight out of Lord of the Rings style. Like you just came from the Shire to work a little, little, little mountain manish, I guess, but I don't know. I just, I'm just more comfortable that way. So, and I figured, you know, I've not been fortunate. I've never gotten like athlete's foot or anything like that, but yeah. Um, you're immune. Just wash, wash your feet while you're in the shower. Don't the water just trickle down there. Wash your feet. That'll save you from it. All right. Endless tips today. Well, thank you so much 
um, Moose, yeah. for coming on here and talking with me for, uh, you know, we went a little long, but it was a pleasure to listen to and get to know. And I hope that, yeah. um, I don't know. I hope to meet you. Maybe we've crossed paths before on Warp Tour. I, I don't recall. As you know, we meet a lot of people, but we have a yeah. lot of mutual friends. So I hope we get to hang out sometime IRL. Yeah, I will. We, we have each other's numbers and, you know, I'll, I'll hit you up, let you know what I have for tours coming up and you can grab a lunch. 